anything you want to say that I haven't asked or, or is there anything you want to communicate to the audience or, or just in general, uh, I'll say speak your piece that I haven't necessarily yeah. said or, or. Well, we, we talked a little bit before the program uh, about how uh, an entirely different society is possible. And I think that even most progressives don't haven't fully internalized that and understood kind of exactly uh you know what what i mean at least when i say that and so when i say that is you know i mean that i look at the difference between our society's potential uh where we could be in terms of again the criteria of maximizing human well-being sustainably and so i look okay what is that potential the potential is something distinct from our actual level you know, of kind of existence and the actual level at which we're satisfying human needs. And the difference between that potential and where we actually are has never been greater in human history. Yeah. You know, today, the potential that we have to exist in something that resembles Star Trek, you know, or something something in which people's, all of people's basic needs are, are completely met, you know, these things, these are things, uh, it has never been greater before in human history. You know, and I think of that, the, di the difference between those two things, our potential and where we are, as a measure of political failure, you know? Yes. And so the political failure accounts for that difference. And so basically, uh, you know, these are things that FDR proposed 80 years ago. When he ran in 1932, he also talked about it in the State of the Union in 1944. He ran on an economic bill of rights, you know, and it was provide food, water, clothing, you know, housing, uh, uh, basic, uh, it was recreation even, you know, freedom, uh, a, a good job, freedom from monopolies. Um, and so that was possible 80 years ago. Yeah. And the determinants of what's possible is very different from the determinant of what exists. What our potential level of development is determined by the resources that we have, the technology that we have, and our knowledge to basically combine those things. Yeah. And those are the real determinants of where we are as a society. You know, politics has nothing to do with it. It's, it's, it's really a calculation of those resources and our potential to use them, you know, our technology. And so I think until you understand things like the, uh, that current estimates are that, you know, we could end extreme poverty for $140 billion a year. Well, that's less than a quarter of the military budget of one country on this planet, you know, of the United States. Uh, and we could still have the biggest military budget in the, whole, in the whole world. Or that, you know, we could provide potable water for everyone, you know, across the world for like $30 billion. Or that we could... You know, we could produce all of our food in, uh, in, in through vertical agriculture, yeah. which so that we can farm indoors, basically. You can produce the food at the same place where the population centers are in cities, so then it eliminates, and it's, it's soilless, you know? So you eliminate pesticides, you eliminate fertilizers, and you eliminate all of the fossil fuels and all everything that goes into the transportation of that. Not to mention you free up the 11% of the Earth's surface, which is taken up uh, land surface, which is taken up by right now agriculture, you know, yeah. we could have limitless free, clean energy, basically nearly free, you know, or ver uh, that, that could totally replace uh, fossil fuels in terms of rooftop solar, in terms of geothermal, in terms of wind, and we could move away from a centralized grid into a distributed form of energy production. We could, we could move away from fossil fuels in automobiles and in all vehicles over to electric vehicles. You know, it's like, that's what's technically possible. There's nothing, there's no, again, there's no law of nature and there's no like divine edict, which is holding us back from those things. It's Human just choice. the way that we've set up our society and that we've set up our economy, you know? It's insane. It's, and and it's I insane. think- It doesn't make sense. Yeah. I think that if we don't do those things, um, I think, uh, I mean, I, something that very much motivates me is the concept of existential risk. And that's the idea that we as human beings now have the ability to wipe ourselves out basically with our own technology. 
Uh, and we achieved that about 70 years ago with nuclear weapons. And well, even backwards, the way, like, like yeah. what you're saying is even a backwards way of killing ourselves off. Like yeah. everything, like it, it's amazing. Like the talking about that are befalling us just based on our normal way of operation. Like we consider it just as normal and natural as can be, and we're killing ourselves just by being as normal as natural can be. So we have animal habitation where we're killing these animals in order to buy hamburgers. And this is messed up in two ways. You've taken a human being and you've had that human being with all the potential in the world dropping french fries. That particular human being who's dropping french fries is also flipping hamburgers. That hamburger came from a cow that was on some farm somewhere where they were using the land and destroying the land. Now, the, the animal agriculture has just as much problematic as, as um, fossil fuels, meaning in regards to, to climate change. It has a 50%, it's like 50% of the things that they're saying calls climate change comes from animal habitation, meaning the way we do our animals, animal agriculture. So the person who's eating that hamburger is somehow contributing to his own demise of the planet. In addition to contributing to the guy who's flipping hamburgers, who's subordinating themselves with a little stupid looking hat and a shirt on, flipping french fries, all the potential of this particular human being being turned into a drone. This is messed up on several ways, including this particular guy getting a low wage job while the money is funneling to the top. This entire process is a capitalist process. This person is doing a job because that person needs a job, not because they love it, meaning this aspect of that person that's required for that person to be self-actualized, for that person to feel like it's completely subjugated and subordinated and giving a low wage. The company itself is putting massive amounts of cash in the hands of a very few people, so the company itself is making a huge amount of cash. The cows that they're using, for the most part, are being brutalized and tortured in these pens while at the same token destroying the planet in the process. Now, this is considered just normal. And yet, this is something that's destroying the planet. The person who drove his car to work or drove his car to get that hamburger, again, contributing to the demise of the planet using the fossil fuels in order to do it. This is just our normal everyday life. The plastic that the thing was wrapped in is now in our oceans. What, by 2030, more plastic in our oceans than fish. Our sperm count in the West down by 40, 50%. 40% of the extinctions that have taken place over the last 40 years. This is our behavior. Like, this is not... Like, this is what we, as human beings, consider normal, natural behavior. The, th the fact is, there is no such thing as normal, natural behavior. Human beings are naturalized and socialized based upon the conditions to which they're raised in. In this case, we've natural and normalized ourselves based around something that's not real, mm -hmm. cash. While at the same token, the planet itself that we're living on is being destroyed by the pursuit of that unreal thing. You're right. It's amazing. Like, I guess my point is, it's not just being able to destroy ourselves with nuclear weapons. We're also destroying ourselves based on the behaviors that we've taken around the globe. I, I, I totally agree. I totally, um, and, and I think there was a, you know, when we crossed that line where we developed nuclear weapons, though, it became materially distinct uh, because any, you know, intolerant uh, tyrant you know, or uh, or warlord in the past could not, they're, they're, you know, no matter how uh, militant they may have been and how ruthless they may have been, there was no single individual or no single country that could literally end the existence of a human species, you know, yeah. and that's no longer true is, you know, it began with one country, the United States, development of atomic weapons, uh, and now it has proliferated to about uh, uh, it's nine countries, and then there's about 16 more paranuclear countries, uh, which have the ability to produce a nuclear bomb very quickly. And the atom bomb has become a lot more powerful itself. Oh, yes. It's become the hydrogen bomb is thousands of times more powerful than it was than the ones that were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. And so that there's two different trends that that existentially threatening technology of nuclear weapons entered once it was developed, once it was invented. It entered one trend, which was it, uh, it became more destructive with time, exponentially. It entered another trend, which is it proliferated over time, exponentially. And so now combine, and, and so the risk increases as you do that, basically, from the technological perspective. The weapon's in more hands, and it's more dangerous, more destructive. But now what we're talking about doing, you know, in the next few years of technologies that are in development right now, is you're talking about developing things which make nuclear weapons look like toys, almost. 
You're talking about nano weapons. You're talking about biological weapons. You're talking about artificial intelligence. And so those things are themselves existentially threatening technologies because nuclear weapons were the first, but they weren't the last. And so e each time you develop one of these new ones, you know, like uh, bioweapons, like nanotech, you know, it enters the same two trajectories that nuclear weapons did. That is, it proliferates and it becomes more powerful. Man. And so you get this, you get this scenario on the aggregate where there are many more existentially threatening technologies, all of them becoming more powerful, all of them spreading into more hands. And it's a situation that has explosive potential, basically, for the human species. Yeah. And I think that, and, and very, you know, very dire consequences. And I think that unless we manage that correctly, it could be that intelligent civilizations wipe themselves out at a very high rate in the universe, you know, for specifically reasons like this. And I think that the role that politics plays and the reason that, you know, that one of the reasons that, that I myself am in politics is because politics acts as a multiplier for all of that. So when you have a society which is premised on conflict and artificial scarcity and deprivation, then the risk of that, of, of some kind of catastrophe, is magnified exponentially as well. And so I think that, you know, it provides a kind of even additional, you know, incentive that is existential at this point to really change the way that we operate. It's, you know, it's our, our survival, both uh, on, on kind of an individual level uh, and on a humane level uh, and on a moral and spiritual level, I think, that is at stake here. But it's, it's now the stakes are even, you know, it's, it's our survival outright, you know, as a species. Uh, yeah, and that increases with time. But the, the other side of that coin is what we talked about before. That is, technology is just a tool. And it, the same way that it can, it can destroy us and it could annihilate us, we could annihilate ourselves with it. It could create a world which is, you know, kind of beyond our imagination in terms really of did. allowing I, us to self-actualize, meeting our needs. Yeah.